Hey, hey, Tony Gaskins here. Listen to me. Now, I wanted to talk about this because I was on Instagram and I saw a guy. Well, what led up to it? He probably was the tipping point. But last night, a guy commented, oh, here go Tony Gaskins. He pandered to women. And it's always people who haven't really seen my message and I'm not really sure what they mean by pander because one thing I know a lot of black men don't have the greatest education including myself so just to be honest I don't think a lot of black men who use the word pander knows what it actually means and so I think what they really mean is like he makes videos in favor of women sometimes or videos that take up for women or protect women. Like, I'm not sure what they actually mean when they say pander and what they think they mean. But it, it was, you know, just a, a guy. He had like one or two followers and it was nothing. But he wrote a long message and he going back and forth with women in the comments. And the video was about if your son plays sports. And there was another guy who he came in like, here go another Derek Jackson, which it's crazy that everybody says Derek's name when Derek came in onto the scene five years after I had been on the scene doing relationship life coaching. But what Derek did differently is he played to the algorithm. So he did clickbait. He did um, celebrity gossip, like he used celebrity faces in the thumbnails. He used celebrity names. He talked about hot topics. And whenever I would go to the shade room, I would see Derek in the comments on like every post. I never did any of those things. I never used celebrity thumbnails. I never talked about celebrity business. And I have never once in the entire existence of me being on Instagram, which is now, I think, eight years or nine years. I've never once commented on a Shade Room post. And so I specifically do not chase clout. I speak about something if I have to speak about, it, like if I get a lot of requests, if I get pressed on it. But if you notice... If you go on my YouTube, I think you'll be hard pressed to find one thumbnail of of me using a thumbnail of a celebrity. I don't do clickbait. I don't do things for clout. I do things out of purpose and to teach a lesson. And that's the difference. And that's what's so sickening and sad about this whole thing to where you can't even do anything positively anymore without it being gamified or taken advantage of so here i was i come in nobody was doing relationship coaching not a single soul people say you know mention miles monroe having videos to men or videos to women and things like, i had never heard of miles monroe he's not even american to my knowledge so and, and i think he passed away god rest his soul god bless his family if i'm not mistaken but I have to even say that because I literally know nothing about him. I've never watched one of his videos, maybe 30 seconds. And the reason why is because I don't, when somebody does something similar to me, I don't watch their work because I don't want to carry their message. We are all messengers of God if you work for God. And I don't want to carry no one else's message because then I'm just stacking on top of them. I'm there duplicate um their carbon copy when an original is always worth more than a carbon copy than a replica so i don't believe in so when i watch messages i'm watching people from different industries to grab lessons and metaphors from other in industries so from sports from health and wellness like dieting and fitness from finance from real estate I don't watch relationship coaches. I don't watch life coaches, so to speak. And yeah, you, anybody's a life coach, even if you're doing finance, it's still life coaching. But if I watch somebody, it's like they study the mind. 
they study the body, they study gut health, they study nutrition, they study fitness. And I add that to to my message if, if it makes sense. But I don't watch people who look just like me, come from where I, similar situation, do what I do because I don't want to copy anybody's message. So a lot of times people say, name, watch this, and it, it really don't understand what they're saying. And it's kind of how like, when you watch Kobe Bryant, God rest his soul, if you watch his Kobe Bryant highlights, a lot of it literally is a carbon copy of Michael Jordan highlights. And But when you watch Michael Jordan's highlights, we don't have anybody before Michael Jordan that did the same exact moves. So here comes Michael, he's the originator. He is the original. And then from Michael, there are a lot of replicas and duplicates who has added their own grit to it their own style to it like kobe did but other than them two nobody else really doing those moves that they did and playing the way they play and the intensity they lead a team michael jordan and kobe bryant they're in their own league and with the way they do things and kobe was inspired by michael but here's what happens the adversary, Satan, evil, is always an imitator of good, of righteousness, of God. And so when somebody comes into a lane doing something organically, authentically, and for the right reasons, and it looks like it's going well, there's always going to be imitators. There's always going to be people who come and copy it, but pervert it. So you can go and get a credit card and do credit card arbitrage, which I don't even know what it means really, but you can get this credit card and you can use it for the points, get the points, get all the bonuses, get your money back, get you some cash back. So it's essentially like you just did what you did, that flight or the money you spent, you did it at a discounted rate because they give you points and then you could turn them points into gift cards. Well, somebody come and do that and it's completely by the book and it's legal. But then it's going to be somebody who come into the credit card game and they pervert it. They start somehow stealing money, stealing your identity, getting your credit, copying your credit card, spending money on your credit card, buying gift cards with your credit card, and they're going to pervert it and ruin it for everybody. So then the credit card comes, got to crack down, it's too much fraud, it's too much chargebacks. And that's what's happening in the relationship space is there were a handful of guys that for one, it was me first in 2007. In 2007, there were no black men talking about love and relationships. And social media was not really a thing like that. I blew up in 2010 on Twitter where my page started to go viral when Lisa Keys retweeted me and then from there a lot of celebrities started retweeting me. At that time, I was the only one. The only person that talked about relationships other than me was Steve Harvey. On a national scale as a black male, it was Steve Harvey. And he only did it with that book, Act Like a Lady think like a man. And he did that in 2009. Let it be clear, my first book was published in 2007. And I had in my book in 2007, something called the three month rule. In 2009, Steve Harvey had something called the 90 day rule. 90 days is three months. My rule was a man will only wait for a woman to sleep with a woman 90 days if he's serious about her. Steve rule was a woman should not sleep with a man inside of 90 days. So the rules were sound about the same, but slightly different. Steve's ghostwriter for his book is a woman. And at that time, majority of black women knew who I was. And Steve added to it about being 90 days on a job and this and that. And then in 2012, that is when I heard of Rob Hill Sr. 
I had dinner with Rob. Rob said, I'm not a relationship coach. I'm not a life coach. I'm, I speak on love. I write on love. He's a writer. He was a poet. But because he wrote so well, people thought that he was a relationship coach. So, hold on right quick. So he started getting, he started getting booked to be a speaker at relationship events. Rob was not married. Rob was not engaged. The way I met Rob Hill was a young lady who followed me. She DM'd me and she said, hey, you should check out my boyfriend at Rob Hill. I went to his page. I was at the mountaintop by myself as a life coach slash relationship coach but i was mostly known for relationships but i talked about life all day but people are so consumed with love and relationship that's what went viral but majority of my stuff was life coaching through all throughout the day all of my tweets i sent 17 tweets a day and i looked at rob's page and, and i'm saying names because it's, it's important to say names in this right here i don't normally say names but i went to rob's page and all of his tweets were original and I, that was such, such a breath of fresh air for me because it was so many guys starting to copy my tweets verbatim. Like whoever was running Rev Run's page was stealing my tweets. Whoever was running, and I, I went at Rev Run throat one day and then they tweeted from his page, when you mess up, fess up at Tony Gaskins. And then they sent the tweet out again and which was my quote and they added me at the end of it and that sent me some followers and but one time one of my colleagues was at an event and rev ron was on the panel and a tweet tweets were going out from his account and then she texted me she said hey rev don't actually rev ron don't actually run his account because he up here speaking but i'm seeing tweets go out on his page i said oh that makes sense probably one of his daughters or whoever, and that makes sense. They're young, they young people don't understand branding. They don't understand how bad they make him look when they stealing. And because I only had a handful of followers, like maybe 25, 50,000 followers to his hundreds of thousands, they probably thought nobody know this dude because I didn't have a TV show on BET or MTV. So they probably thinking nobody gonna find out, but no, I called it out. And then, a lot of accounts started stealing my tweets and I don't know if they, well see, people did not run their Twitter. Back then, social media was still new. It's 20, 2009, 2010. So I saw my tweets on a lot of famous pastors pages, Joe Osteen, Paula White. Uh, somebody started a fake TD, TD Jakes page. It was fake, it wasn't TD Jakes. And then one day the person tweeted, uh, follow these two great men and I was one of those people so all of these bishops started following me like in big name pastors you know Jamal Bryan E. Dewey Smith D Bishop Dale Bonner like people who was had like mega churches in their city they started following me so then my quote started going everywhere I went to Bishop Dale Bonner church and met him and went into his office after the service because we connected on Twitter. And when I'm sitting in his church and I'm at the sermon, he putting up quotes on the screen. Albert Einstein quote, Ralph Waldo Emerson quote, then my quote. But with my quote, he didn't have my name on it. I don't know if he just didn't know it was mine or if he didn't believe it was mine or if he just, as a black man, didn't want to attest that a black man half his age was helping feed his sermon, helping his sermon, helping his message get across. Then it was like another famous dead white person quote. And then it was my quote again. So at this point, I'm kind of like, I don't understand. Like, is he trying to flatter me? Is he trying to disrespect me? Like, does he not know those are my original quotes? Because my quotes got blood in the ink. And so when I read my quote, I know it's my quote because I, I remember where I wrote it at, why I wrote it, and what I was going through when I wrote it. So, or what I had seen, or what I had learned, or what I had experienced. So I know me. 
It's just like a, a artist know his painting. An artist know his music. I know my quotes. And so it started going viral. The people was making six figures from Twitter through different little sites because it was sites that you could go to the site and you can put a budget in $100 to promote your book. And then pages could come and they could post that tweet and they get paid out of your hundred dollar budget for every click they get on your link to your book to your website or to your amazon page or whatever link you want to send people to so what happened is it was a guy named brandon hampton he big now brand well brandon he, he transitioned he did all but it was a white guy his name brandon hampton so you had brandon hampton and then up under brandon he had devin word law and then they added in spectacular so Brandon ran big pages. He ran Dave Chappelle page, which was a fake page. He ran the notebook, which was the, uh, Nicholas Sparks book. He ran all kind of fake pages. Every celebrity who wasn't on Twitter yet, Brandon started a page in their name. Then Devin started doing the same thing. Spectacular started doing the same thing. Now Spectacular got a media company. These pages was posting my quotes. I figured out who I DM the page because they all started following me. All the pages followed me. I DM say, hey, y'all using my quotes. Take it down. Let me get your page shut down. He DM me, hey, my name is Brandon. Let's get on the phone. We get on the phone. He tell me how he shows me how he's making six figures from Twitter and using these accounts. Next thing you know, I meet this lady. She's Dave Chappelle's manager. So we started talking and I told her, well, Dave Chappelle page over here, I know the guy who, who run it. Do you want to connect with him? He said, he'll run the page for you. The lady was like, what? The lady was like, somebody running a page for Dave? Dave ain't on Twitter. I said, well, yeah, but the guy running the page and then Brandon told me, ask her, can I run the page? So I asked her, could he run the page and do she want to connect? She got the page shut down. They were like, oh, this kid running the page, got the page shut down. But dude was making like six figures from Dave Chappelle's name. And he just kept doing that. And so what happened was he there was a site called Fave Star. And basically what the site did, what Brandon told me, he was like, I'm not stealing your quotes. He said, I'm going to Fave Star. And Fave Star has a list of the most retweeted quotes on Twitter. And your quotes is in that list. It'll have like the top 30, the top 100. And so Twitter used to show you on the home page if you was viral. I showed up on that page a lot of times. And being a nobody, I was working a job making $9.50, but people thought I was a millionaire because I went on Oprah in 2009 to tell my story about being an abusive boyfriend in college when I was playing football. Then I went on Tyra Banks. So my background on Twitter was me and Oprah. So that gave me authority because nobody saw the show. A lot of people saw the show, but it was only one or two people that tweeted me. Are you from that Oprah episode? The episode was in light of Chris Brown and Rihanna. And I went on there and told about an incident that my girlfriend and I had that was not police involved, were no black eyes, was no bust lips. It wasn't like that, but I trumped the story up to say, hey, I was toxic. Let me tell you about this one day when I found out that my ex had herpes and that she was talking to her ex-boyfriend and that supposedly she caught the herpes from my teammate and things got out of control. Let me tell you about that day. And that's what I went on Oprah and told. Then I went on Tyra Banks with my book in hand and Tyra showed my book to the world. I wrote that book when I was 22 and at 22, I believe no man will wait longer than 90 days to sleep with a woman. That's where I created the three month rule. So here it comes from 10 p.m. to 1030 every day. I would do relationship tweets. From 7.30 a.m. to 10 p.m., I would do life tweets. From That's why my quote, if you don't build your dream, someone will hire you to help them build theirs. That's why that has gone around the world and people thought it was Steve Jobs' quote. 
They quoted it to a billionaire, an Indian billionaire. That's my quote. They quoted it to Far Gray because he got on Twitter doing the same thing that Spectacular and everybody else was doing, which was stealing tweets. And they would just steal the most viral tweets. And I had the most viral tweets on Twitter with Rev Ron and some other people. So one day they ranked the top 100 black men on Twitter. Here I am working a job making $9.50 an hour. And they ranked me at number 25. They ranked me at number 25 out of 100. And then another site did this thing where they score your Twitter based on your retweetability, based on your retweets ratio between followers and the amount of retweets you get. The highest score on this site, this site was called clout.com, I think with a K. The highest score was a 93 on that site. Nobody had a 100 on the site based on their algorithm. You know who had a 93? Chris Brown and Justin Bieber. And they were battling on Twitter, number one and number two with the most followers. And they kept going back and forth. You know who else had a 93 score? Me. So it was just us up there. But here I was a nobody. I tweeted that celebrities got up in arms. They started writing clout because at this time Tyrese followed me he thought he was viral real wrong people watching my page Steve Harvey started following me Ayanna Van Zant started following me Alicia Keys already following me Missy Elliott I'm talking about uh, P Diddy was posting my my tweets but not putting at Tony Gaston he would just put TG so whether he was running or somebody else and it thing blew up it blew up Rihanna never supported me. She started supporting Rob Hill. She supported Rob Hill because I went on Oprah in light of her situation and told my story. So she probably lumped me in with Chris Brown because if she knew who Rob Hill was, I knew she knew who I was because I put Rob Hill on. Because when I went to Rob Page, I was already that guy in that space. When I went to Rob Page, Rob had less than 500 followers. I tweeted, hey, everybody follow Rob Hill Sr. I put him on. He attests to this when we had dinner in Vegas. He said, yep, I remember that day exactly. When I looked at his page, he had five, around 500 followers. When I tweeted him in a little bit, he went up over 1,500 followers. But at that time, it was so many celebrities following me that he started getting celebrity eyes. So that's how that happened. And then after he started to build, he blew up and then we was like equal in that space. But here's the thing, I'm married, he's not. But our world is so weird that we don't really care about credentials and validation. It's like, if people talking, we gonna listen. And if they saying something that speak to our heart, speak to our mind, they could be the devil. They could be an angel, they could be tall, they could be short, they could be black, they could be white, they could be illiterate, they could be a genius. It could be an out of shape trainer, it could be a broke financial advisor, it could be a single matchmaker, it could be a single marriage coach. Our world does not care about credentials. If you saying something that speak to somebody issue or they problem or what they dealing with, people gonna listen. And so that's how single people who was talking about love started to blow up. And then after Rob Hill, then came the Stephen Labossier, then came the Derek Jackson, then came, and it was a bunch of smaller people, smaller guys who just, they was like Alabama type and Mississippi, and they just sounded really, I'm country. They, sound, they they made me sound like a genius. So those guys like that started popping up. So now all of these brothers popping up. Ain't nobody married but me. And then you got Steve Harvey, but he's on his third marriage. So people kind of, they listen to him. He, they, they sold, he sold millions of books, but yet it was a caliber of woman who's like, I ain't listening to Steve. He's on his third marriage. So it was like, all of this noise, but people was giving respect to certain people. 
And then I remember women would come to my seminars and they would say, oh, yeah, you. Um, I remember it was three women in like their 40s came to one of my tour stops. I was the first relationship coach to start touring the country and touring the world. And it was just because business people were saying, when you write a book, then you become a coach, then you become a speaker. I'm an introvert. I didn't want to be a speaker, but I did it. And I got out there. I started touring. I was the first one. And I was selling out the room, filling up the room. Every city in, in the world that I went to. I went to Johannesburg, South Africa first, before anybody. When I was going to Johannesburg, South Africa, Les Brown called me. Les Brown, the OG. He's a big time speaker. Les Brown called me. Somehow he was on my mailing list. He was on my mailing list because his email was in my inbox. And his daughter followed me on Twitter. And I sent out an email that I was going to Johannesburg, South Africa. Les Brown wrote me back. He said, hey, son, I know you're leaving a lot of money on the table. I want to talk to you about this. Give me a call. I called him. And Les Brown, we talking, and he was like, how are you going to Johannesburg, South Africa? I said, well, I utilize Twitter. He didn't utilize Twitter. He was, he was, you know, before that age. I said, well, I utilize Twitter, and it's two young men in South Africa that follow me, and they DM me and said they want to bring me to Johannesburg. He was like, it's crazy that you're going to Johannesburg, and I've never been invited there to speak. So it was like... The old school beat the new school. It was like, whoa, what y'all young boys doing? How you doing something before I did it and I'm the OG? And then, sure enough, I told them who it was. Um, they reached out. I told them about DJ Spoo. They made the connection, him or his daughter or his team. When I got to South Africa, DJ Spoo brought me on the radio. And at that time, when he brought me on the radio, he was talking to Les Brown on the phone. Les Brown had them winning back though, or somehow they reached out to him too. And now they was getting ready to bring him over there. But I broke that barrier and went over there as a 29 year old. I was 29, no speaking training, no media coach, no publicist, no nothing. So here I am, I'm out there. I'm out there and Les was like, how much they paying? I said 10,000. That was the most I had been paid at that time. And after that, the U.S. started to blow up and uh, like just really get big in, in seminars. Seminars started to take off because what happened too is when I started touring, of course there's seminars and conferences going on, but the way stuff is exposed in our world today is through media. So a pastor could have a conference and have a thousand people come but if he only got 300 followers on Twitter, don't nobody know but his city and that congregation. And that's how it was. So I started helping pastors build a social media following. And that's what I was doing. And I was charging them $400 a month. And I would just retweet them essentially two or three times a week. And they would just get my following, my following who's real followers because I never paid for followers, never did any tricks or gimmicks. My whole following was organic. And I had built up and crossed 50,000 followers, 100,000 followers. When people like me who was working a job, making $9.50 an hour like I was, didn't have more than 100 followers. And that's how it started to change. So now what happened is young black men who did not make it in sports, did not want to be a drug dealer, did not want to work in corporate America, what have you, they started seeing me and I would guess Steve Harvey and then also then Rob Hill came up and then they started seeing this and like, hey, this is a viable career path. But what they didn't realize is it wasn't a career path at first. Like I wrote my book in 2007. My first paid relationship speaking engagement came in 2010 and it was for $1,500. And that was the only one that I got in 2010. And then I can't remember another. And I started touring in 2012. And my first tour stop 
was Atlanta and I sold 61 tickets and I think I grossed $2,500. The room costed a thousand and the event planners was a group of three sisters out of LA charged me, I think a thousand to do that. So, and then I had to pay for a hotel. So I didn't make any money. I probably sold some books. And then after that, I kept going. And then I got up to like, 100 people, 150, 200, and I averaged around between two and 300 people in every city. And then later, after my Facebook blew up in 2013, 2014, in 20, like between 2014 and 2016, I still was touring. And that's when I did like 600 tickets in Chicago for a free event. And then I came back and did, I think, 600 tickets for a paid event. And then I did like six or 700 tickets in Atlanta. And I wasn't doing any real marketing. I just posted here and there, but my page was viral. And so people started to see this as, you gotta understand, as black people, you coming from the inner city, you don't see a lot of options. You don't see, so when they see somebody with a successful blueprint and they see somebody going to cities around the country and selling 300 tickets people started coming to me from the music industry like from def jam i met a a and r from def jam and his assistant they had dinner with me and they said tony we got def jam artists that cannot sell 300 tickets to the club for their performance and you talking about love and relationships and you selling 300 tickets, not just in A cities, A cities like A markets like Atlanta and Houston and New York. They saying you selling 300 tickets in B and C cities, like smaller cities. You going to Jackson, Mississippi and selling out. You going to Montgomery, Alabama and selling out. You going to these different cities and talking up just standing on the stage by yourself with a microphone, with no graphics, with no PowerPoint, with no DJ, with no food, and you selling hundreds of tickets. And listen, that's because I work for God, and that's because my heart is pure. That's because while I'm going through all this, I'm doing all this, I'm faithful to my wife. I'm living what I teach. I'm living what I teach. Me and my wife, our issues that we really had was 2007 to 2009 through that space. That's when we was really getting to know each other. We going through it. You know, you button heads, you young. 2010, we hit a stride. We hit a stride. So when I, so when my brand blew up, I ain't had no funny business. Me and my wife, we was on good terms. And that's what happened. And so when people started looking, so now these guys, because of the way Derrick Jackson played it, same thing. With the other guys, a lot of other guys, they played into clickbait, they played into uh, thumbnails, all of that right there. So then later, years later, um, probably around this time, I, I don't I don't know when it was. It probably was when my daddy wrote his book. He wrote a book, Eight Mistakes Women Make in Relationships. One day my dad was looking on Twitter and he saw a video by R.C. Blakes called 10 Mistakes Women Make in Relationships. And then we saw some other titles that was very similar to my titles from Brother um, Bishop Blakes. And I had already been out there. I had already established myself. I was already the blueprint. And at this time, Bishop Blakes was very small. Like he had no audience really on YouTube. But a lot of the titles was the same. So then he came in and he did a blueprint. But being older, being married, being a bishop, he probably was trying to gain some insight and not necessarily copying, like plagiarizing, but trying to follow a blueprint. And if he tell his story, his side of it, he probably will say, yeah, I looked to this person or that person or that person, and it might have not been me, it could have been some other people who followed me. But what happened was, is I was innovating in the space because then memes came around. First, it was just tweets. Then Instagram came. 
when Instagram came, I didn't get on Instagram. I don't like social media. I'm slow to it. So when I got on Instagram, Rob Hill Sr. had 400,000 followers on Instagram when I got on Instagram. But when I got into that space, people respected my name. So I caught and passed Rob Hill Sr. He was at 400,000. I was at zero. I caught up to him at 400,000. And then my following went past that. And then I plateaued because all of that growth that got me up to 900,000 is just pure organic. No tricks. No tricks. So meaning I never comment on other pages to be seen in the comments. I did that one time recently on Charlemagne page. And that's the only comment I think I've ever left on a celebrity page in the existence of my Twitter. And I know Charlemagne personally. I got his phone number. I text him. So that's different. But I never have clout chased on any blog site to be in their comments ever. And so I didn't comment. I think I recently left one comment in the Black Marriage Movement Instagram page. And so here it was. I started seeing my blueprint everywhere and I was making it up as I go. So in that space, I saw myself like Michael Jordan. And then there started to come Kobe Bryant's. Because I was making it up because when I got started, there was nobody doing it. And so memes come around. I said, you know what? I But memes were only funny. They were only, memes was only funny. On the little quote cards. I said, you know what I should do? I should put quotes on these little backgrounds, these solid color backgrounds. I started doing that. None of the pastors was doing it. When I started doing that, then I started seeing T.D. Jake's account do it, Paula White, Joe Osteen, Steve Harvey. I started seeing everybody else's account doing it. But you got to remember, when it came on them scores from Clout, I was number one. I was tied for number one with Chris Brown and Justin Bieber. And so I became a blueprint in the inspirational space. That's why Rev Run, who was known as Rev Wisdom, Rev one, Rev Run Wisdom on Twitter was copying my tweets. And it was my tweets that ended up, they set my tweets on Good Morning America. They, Dr. Phil quoted me. My tweet that went viral, if you don't build your dream, someone will hire you to build theirs. It got put in movies. People, a man wrote me and had, he put my, that quote on the back of his trucks. He got a logistics company. These tweets went around the world and back. I started getting clients from six different continents. And that's how I got to speak in, uh, in Africa and in South Africa specifically. And then after South Africa, two young men from Nairobi, Kenya reached out to me and paid me $10,000. And they took care of flights and hotel and everything. Now listen, this no speaking agent, this no manager, this no publicist, this no team, this just the favor of God. But I'm going into markets that T.D. Jakes wasn't going into, that Steve Harvey wasn't going into, that nobody was going into, and I'm being paid more than what you get paid in America. Because in America, you do a speaking engagement, the max you getting paid for like relationship stuff back then was $5,000. So you go overseas, you get double and you get to see the motherland. You get to see another place. And so it was a beautiful thing. But after I opened that market up, these young men, they started something. Nico, Nico and Lou Yonder in Johannesburg. They from Soweto. These two young hopefuls, these guys, they have no money. They have nothing. They went to DJ Spool and they got the money for the event. DJ Spool was a radio host equivalent to Charlemagne. But when I went to South Africa, I saw DJ Spoo more like a P. Diddy of South Africa. That's what I started calling him when I talked about him. So after that, I connected DJ Spoo with Charlemagne. I connected DJ Spoo with, I think, Missy Elliott. And I started making connections for these people. And then they had competition over there, like some Indian descent people in South Africa started doing major events with the Les Browns of the world and paying them 50K, 100K because them guys come from like oil money or something. And they started doing these big events. And then that's when another group who wanted to jump in, they brought Rob Hill Sr. over there. After I hadn't went maybe once, twice or three times, then they brought Rob Hill over there. And so it was like 
I open the door and people don't, black men, we crabs in a barrel. So that's why you probably never hear these men say my name in an interview or say Tony Gaskin was the blueprint. Like Tony Gaskin opened that door. Like my name was able to build because of what Tony Gaskin did. You probably never hear that from 99.9% .9 of them, but this is the truth of the matter because I was out there and I'm, I'm going to tell it like it is and tell my story on my outlet. And everybody going to have their own variation of their story. And I remember... And now, and see, here's the thing, real recognize real. I at least respected, I, I respected Rob Hill because he used original content. Now, after all of us did all this, then that's when uh, Devon Franklin came out and he got out of, he broke out of like producing films to doing books. And then he did a relationship book with his ex-wife. And so he started doing relationship stuff. But because he was so connected in Hollywood, he was able to just jump past all of us because he was connect he from Hollywood. He live in Hollywood. He work in Hollywood. So Oprah grabbed him up. And then because I had went on Oprah and told my story of being a toxic lover, Oprah really couldn't put her brand with me because of my past. And so Devon Franklin came in with a clean name, clean slate, clean brand, no skeletons in the closet, even though I exposed my skeletons. And I remember they called me to come on Oprah to do a Where Are They Now show, but it didn't work out, it didn't end up happening. And so here we was, this thing started to take off, and now all of these people start to pop up. And what happened is it started to make people mad. People started to get mad because they saw black men doing something other than rapping and drug dealing. And it started to look like black men was getting rich off of giving women advice. Now, here's the thing. What I tell everybody, you always got to evaluate the root. So when I looked at guys, I would say, OK, what's the root of why he doing this? Like what brought you into this space? Like what's your personal story? So for me, my personal story was I was a dog. I was a womanizer. I dog, I cheated a lot. I cheated a lot. I lied a lot. I manipulated a lot. I'm coming into this space to give away the game of a player, to give away a player's game. So the unassuming women, the women who don't know the game, don't have to get played. And I was doing it because my sister was getting played. My mama was getting played and they was mainly my inspiration. I'm like, if the women I know and love are getting played and they have access to talk to me and yet they keep getting played, then how bad is it with women who don't have somebody like me in their life that they could talk to and get the game from? And that's why I started getting the game. But then this will happen. Men started giving away the game but not everybody can handle the clout that come with it. See, when I started getting bigger and all of that, I I was I, I I'll be honest with you. It was some women that I met, some celebrity women that I met that I was floored, that I was like, wow, you know who I am? Like, wow. And I was weak in my spirit. And if those women was weak and I was weak, I probably could have fell into an affair. I could have fell into an affair. I could have ended up doing like at around this time is Alicia Keys was following me. She stopped following me because I had to really go at her and, and Swiss Beach about their situation because I ain't like how Swiss did my Shonda because I'm like, did my Shonda cheat on you? If she ain't cheat on you, you wrong for, for divorcing that woman and then getting with this celebrity just because she got a bigger name, bigger bag, and just because y'all did some work together because I'm like, I could do the same thing. But if I'm out here, you know, standing in the paint and... I could leave my wife for a celebrity woman who got more money, who got a bigger name and do a business move. And people started doing that. And that thing started to make me mad because I'm like, man, we're not, we talk about loyalty as men and we talk about not snitching in the streets and not switching sides and having a code. Where's our code with our women? Why we ain't got no code with our women? Because y'all fellas is leaving your wife, but y'all ain't leaving with no facts that, 
she didn't deserve you or that she cheated on you or that she dogged you out or did you wrong. You just leaving because you see a better opportunity with another woman. But then the woman will be the most evil thing in the world if women start doing that. If we start to see celebrity women and celebrity pastors and just lead a man because another man got more money. And yeah, you're going to have examples, but it started to happen a lot, like even in the church and with pastors cheating on their wives and leaving their wives. And it was like, man, so I'm getting mad. I'm getting mad. And I have a righteous indignation because I take this thing seriously. So I'm flipping tables. So when I started flipping tables, I alienated myself because it's a boys club. It's a fraternity. So when you look at it, Devon Franklin and Torrey Roberts got real close. I ain't know they knew each other. I don't know when they met each other, but I knew Torrey Roberts. Next thing you know, Torrey Roberts, big pastor in Hollywood, got a wife, got three kids. He divorced his wife. He divorced his wife. He get with T.D. Jakes' daughter, Sarah Jakes. They get together. They get married. Boom, power couple. Then here go Devon. He pop up. Devon go get a sex symbol wife, Megan Good. Megan Good is a fantasy for most men. He go marry a woman that is a fantasy for every black man. He married her and then boom, they go through a divorce. And then it's other pastors popping up. Next thing you know, T.D. Jakes, other pastor in Denver, Chris Hill, I think his name. He gets sat down, I think, for an affair. Then John Gray's situation come up. It, it sounded like it wasn't no real affair, but it just sounded like it was some stuff that was, you know, some conversations. All of us got that in our past. All of us got that in our story. Nearly every man. It's probably some men who don't have none of that in their story but we don't know, but everybody got that. So I never came out, I never even said their names out publicly before this video. And I'm just saying this just to paint real examples, not to bash nobody, not to talk bad about nobody. This just, this real facts, this verifiable information that happened. It ain't like I'm telling some behind the scenes secret knowledge that don't none of y'all know if you know the people. And so now I'm seeing guys go through divorces, but here's the thing. Tory Roberts connected with me and brought me out and had me preach at his church three times. I really liked the brother. Then he go through a divorce. So that was that was a black eye, you know, for his church and just for, for the people. And there was a lot of people that came to me very upset about that. Very because they loved, they loved his ex-wife. And then Devon Franklin get married and making good. That was kind of like a little black eye in the sense of it's just a lot of women didn't understand it. A lot of women was like, you know, she a sex symbol. She show all her breasts. She show all this cleavage. It's like she kind of like a temptress. And so that was like an uproar. And somebody even said it on the microphone on the video. And Von Frank had to check her, check the lady. But he knew what it was. He, he, he understood it deep down as a man. You got to know. You got to know. Because I just seen LeBron James' wife the other day. And this woman dressed in full sweats. She'll put on a dress when they stepping out like nice, but she go to the game, she in sweat, sweatpants, sweatshirt with a big trench coat. Like, it's, it looked like she ain't trying to show nobody, no booty, no nothing. And so that kind of started to cause a little riff. Then TDJ, other pastor got sat down. Then I think it, then, you know, even more recently, we saw the Hillsong pastor. And then I went to speak at another church. So these pastors was inviting me because I think they thought that tweet from TDJ's account was real. But when TDJ started his real account or his real account had to denounce that tweet and say, hey, if you follow this page over here, that is not Bishop J's account. That is not a real account. And then so some of the bishops unfollowed me. But through this process of that tweet and my brand, I got to meet Marvin Sapp. And spoke at his church. I got to meet Keon Henderson and spoke at his church. I got to meet Bishop Dale Bonner. I got to meet uh, Bishop Jamal Bryant. I got to meet so many pastors and bishops just because of how my name was growing. But I started to look at people and I'm like, man, uh, Pastor Jamal Bryant went through his stuff with his wife and all the rumors around that and then his divorce. And then more recently, Keon Henderson went through his divorce and then he got with 
uh, Shawnee O'Neal, which I know both of them personally and then been in person with both of them. So that's why a lot of times people be wanting me to speak on stuff. And that's why I don't speak on stuff because I done met these people in person. I met John Gray in person. That's why when Derrick Jackson kept speaking on his situation and putting his picture up and talking on him, I didn't put up uh, the brother picture and say his name and talk about him like that and just go at him. I talked about pastors cheating, but I ain't say his name. If he listened to it, he could have felt a conviction. But I ain't say his name in it during that season because I wanted to be respectful of what he was going through and we didn't have all the facts. Women were saying one thing, he was saying another. I met John Gray. I did not have a clue who John Gray was. I was in New York at the All-Star Game to see some of my mentees. Anthony Davis, who played for the Lakers, had gave me two, me and my wife, two tickets, had invited us up to his suite. So I was in his hotel going to his suite and I was either going or coming down, and this gentleman who was bigger than me came up to me, and he said, hey, you're Tony Gaskins. And I said, yeah. I said, I said nice to meet you. He said, I'm John Gray. He said, I'm a associate pastor or some type of pastor at Lakewood. I did not remember his name. I did not remember the name of his church. I did not know the, the name of his church was Joe Osteen Church. The way I found out and put this all together because I didn't even remember him until I started working in the NBA and I was in Texas and the guy who hired me for the NBA team took me to church and said, and it was a Wednesday night and he said, John Gray is preaching. He said, you know him? I said, no, I don't. But then after he was preaching and then later he said he worked with athletes too, like Steph Curry and all of them. I said, oh, that's the guy I met at the the uh new york all-star game i'm like oh so now you have to look at how i'm looking at this thing here go stephan labossier pop up never seen his wife never seen a wife never seen a wife and when somebody first asked me who he was i googled him i googled him and a mug shot come up he got on a white t-shirt it's a mug shot i click on it and and if i'm remembering correctly i thought it said domestic violence Later, I Google it was gone. You could get that stuff scrubbed, sponged, or whatever. And he got into all of that. He got all into all the funnels and all the ads to where I see my book on Amazon and his book being promoted up under mine. And that was Stephen Labossier. He built. He used the thumbnails. He used the clickbait. He 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 really mastered the business of it. Derek Jackson did the exposure thing. Celebrity names commenting this right here. Me and Rob Hill, we built differently. We built off raw talent. We built off a raw gift. Both of us are writers, and our writing is what built our following. I've never seen Rob on YouTube. I, I've never seen a Rob Hill senior YouTube channel or video. He built off writing and then got to do events and he can articulate himself and speak. The next thing you know. I get an invite one day from uh, an email from Ace Metaphor. It was some years back. And he said, hey, me, Derek Jackson, Stephen Labossier going on tour. Will you go on the tour? And I didn't align my brand with people because when he said them three names, I'm like, none of y'all married. And so I'm like, I'm not finna go on a tour with three guys that's not married. Talking about love and relationships. Like, you got to show me that you can do what you teaching about. And for me to really you know, vibe with what you talking about. So I was going to New York for my own seminar. They was about to have a seminar in New York. The guy Ace Metaphor, he, he offered me a thousand dollars. I did my own seminar in New York and made 12,000. So that offer was far be far less than my market value. And I was the first in the space. I was the OG in the space. And you just don't, I don't believe in super teams. I don't believe in teaming up and I don't like panels because everybody have a difference of opinion and the audience a lot of times leave more confused than they came because this guy said this this guy said this this guy said this so they went on tour they did their own thing and i was on tour by myself and we were selling the same numbers it was the same amount of people came and i wrote what i was gonna say earlier it was three women that i was talking to from my vip group and they said yeah we went to Derek jackson um event you know they said we went to rob hill event 
They said we went to sleep. And they said we went to Derrick Jackson event. And it was like, we went to the event, he said good stuff. He said a lot of good stuff. He said a lot of real stuff. But it was like, we're not going to listen to him. Like, we're not going to take him seriously because he's not married. And this is what they told me. I'm pretty sure if they went and talked to them men, they probably said, well, yeah, we went to Tony Gass thing. He was unorganized. He just had a microphone. He ain't had no this and that. So I, I, I understood that they probably was just telling me what they thought I wanted to hear and because they in front of me. But if they was in front of them, they probably would have said something else. And so all of this is what led up to understanding today is, and I saw last night, this guy, the guy almost sound illiterate. He almost sound illiterate, bumping his gums. And to be honest with you, his hand mannerisms and his voice inflection sound like he like men. It sound like a lot of homosexual men that you hear and see like he 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 had some femininity and then he talking about love and relationships and then he called himself a guru that's always a red flag you've never seen in my bio guru or expert ever i never call myself a guru or expert i'm a servant so it's a red flag when a person call themselves a guru or expert because a person cannot label themselves a guru or expert. The people got to do that. So when somebody bring me on their show, they might put relationship expert. That's them naming me. I ain't tell them to name me that. And when I see it, I tell them, take off relationship. You can put life coach. You can put author. I mean, take off expert. Don't call me an expert. Don't call me a guru. I don't want that title. I don't want, I don't want to be at that standard. I want to be a person who is sharing and teaching as I learn. And so today we got a bunch of frauds. And what showed me this guy here was a fraud that I seen. I can't remember his name except for he had a guru in it. Is he got it, he got it pinned of him buying a Benz. And it's like, so you selling relationships and you talk about relationships, but then you showing that you done bought you a Benz. So now it make it look like you just talking on this stuff just to get money. It's okay to have a nice car. I got a lot of nice cars, but I don't flaunt my nice cars. You might see me talking, doing a video, but I ain't flaunting it. That's my lifestyle. But I also have several companies and I got several streams of income. And the least amount of money that I make come from relationship stuff. It's the stuff I talk about life and business that make me the most money. And so that's where, that's how I started to see and know that a lot of guys was not really doing all that well because I, I knew that I was the OG and I'm at the top and I know what my finances look like. And I know I had to add several streams of income. But what you have to realize is some people, they make a hundred thousand. That's a, that's a great living. Me, I didn't want to settle right there. I didn't want to stop right there and say, oh, I can make 36,000 off of life coaching. I'm good. No. I want my kids to have a college fund. I want to have generational wealth. So I had to create other businesses and other streams of income to build my brand. But see, what happened was God also, he called me to this because I'm reluctant to it. And I really don't want to be doing relationship coaching, but it's so much pain. It's so much hurt. It's so much manipulation and deception and people losing their lives. So I feel convicted to share what I share. And men call it pandering. And so even at the expense of not even having male friends because of my message, I still carry the message. And it's not money that's keeping me in it because I can make more money in real estate. I can make more money in crypto. I can make more money in stock trade, in day trade. I can make more money in several different, in, in being a medical sales person than what I make from specific relationship teaching. But I do it because it's purpose and it's calling. But for what a guy started doing is they did turn it into a business. They used the relationship advice as a bait and then they sold books. They sold T-shirts because little do people know Derek Jackson wasn't a relationship coach. Derek Jackson was a T-shirt salesman. He sold creative T-shirts that had quotes. And I met the guy who owned spiritual word i don't know if he still own it i can't remember his name it was a young brother out of Atlanta, and he was fire hot 
with Derrick Jackson because he said Derrick Jackson used to steal his designs. So that was my first knowledge of Derrick Jackson was t-shirts and stealing designs according to other t-shirt creators in the industry. And the guy told me it's several others of us who he stole t-shirts from. It was accusations, allegations. I can't say if it's true or not, but that's what they said. And I knew of it because people were stealing my stuff. And I called out Spectacular about stealing my tweets. He hooked his page up to this, to this site that every one of my tweets got posted on Spectacular personal verified music artist page. And I called him out about that. I called Brandon out about it. I called Devin out about it. I connected with them guys. I know them guys. And they told me how they do business and how they build and how they use social media. So I saw all of this. And the guy Brandon, I ghost wrote a book for one of his pages, The Notebook. I wrote a book. So then the lady who ran the Twitter, The Single Woman, I showed her the game. When I met her, she said, Tony, I learned how to tweet from you. She had a half a million followers. I thought it was a black woman. Turned out it's a white woman from Tennessee. And I thought it was a black woman because the tweet sounded exactly like mine. And I know my dialect and I know my writing style. So I swore it was a black woman. Then when I met her and found out she was a white woman, she cut me off when I ghost wrote the book for Brandon because Brandon pages stole all of our tweets. His pages stole everybody who was viral on Twitter, stole everybody tweets. And she got mad about that. But me, I'm like, I'm not going to make him an enemy. And if I got a gift and I could use his outlet to reach more people with a real word, I ain't going to get stuck in my feelings over his page plagiarizing my tweets when he done told me how it happens. He was like, I'm not stealing your tweets directly. Your tweets is posted on this site without your name because they circulate it. And that's how it's getting put on there. She didn't take the time to talk to him. She just got mad and got butt hurt, not realizing that she was plagiarizing too because she was copying me too and copying other people because she white. That ain't even how, even how you talk. That ain't even how you talk. But that led to her getting, because she white, because she in Tennessee, she got a major book deal with like Thomas Nelson or something before anybody. Got on Oprah, got to partner with Oprah, got everything. And she literally built her whole tweet style off of my tweet style. And she told me that out her mouth verbatim. And so this is what I want y'all to understand is when you work for God and people was coming to me and they were talking to all these different stuff, like all these different people. Listen, I wasn't watching nobody. My eyes on the high calling, on the mark. And then people would introduce me to people. And then it was then that it was later that I met Eric Thomas and he started following me. And we talked on the phone and I met Inky Johnson and the industry it crossed you with everybody. It crossed you with everybody. Me and Eric Thomas and uh, his team, his manager, I had to call them because they had some of my quotes. They had some of my quotes and they were like, and his manager told me like, bro, that bro, we got a team. We got eight staff. Like they finding this stuff online. People attributed this to Eric. They thought it was Eric. I'm like, no, that's out my mud. That's out my blood. And immediately they'll take it down. They'll take it down and out of respect. But that's what happened when your word go viral. And so, but guess what? Because of me having to call guys out. Oh, another thing. When Trent Shelton got started, a lot of people know Trent Shelton. One day on, what was it? One day on Facebook, I posted my quote. You can't expect them to understand your grind if God didn't give them your vision. A young lady came in my comments that's Trent Shelton quote. I say, what? I text Trent Shelton. I say, bro, people accusing me of plagiarizing you. And this my original quote. He wrote me back. Man, I've been saying that since high school. We ain't talked since then. I say, bro, that right there showed me who you is. Because if you've been saying that since high school, you would have never had to come to me for mentorship. Because when he got started, he came to me for mentorship. And we sat down in Dallas in a lady house that I met online, a white lady named Carmen. And he asked me questions and I gave him the game. I gave him the whole game. I, I helped Rob Hill, put Rob Hill on. I opened the door. I gave the game and I get a game freely. Derek Jackson has never reached out to me ever once. Stephanie Bossier never reached out to me. Um, 
I done seen RC Blake's page in my comments on Twitter, I mean on YouTube a couple of times, but we have never spoken. He's never reached out to me. And a lot of times in this space, we don't reach out to each other because we feel that it may be some tension. And I know the real ones, we don't know who, who real and who fake. Because before the news about Derek Jackson came out, I was starting to believe him. When I first seen him, I'm like, I, 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 absolutely not. But because he was consistent for some years from like, Whenever I seen him, I probably didn't see him until like 2015 or something. But when I looked up his book one time, I think it said 2012 or something like that. So that's how I know when people really jumped into the game based on when their first book came out. But a lot of times you could be in the game before your name get out there. And so listen to me. Same thing with Trent Young. I gave the game. And even with the other people that started to come up with the Eric Thomases of the world and all of these different people, their team was helping them out. Them personally probably would have said, do not copy Tony Gaskin's stuff. Don't steal his stuff. Don't plagiarize his stuff. But when you got college kids working for you, this generation, they cut corners. They cut corners. They cheat. They steal. They lie. They manipulate. They want a lot for a little bit. That's the generation. So that's how my quotes ended up on all of these top people pages because of who they had working for them. And then when I see it, a lot of times I don't see it, my sister live on social media. She would send me my quotes because she know me. She know my voice. She my only sibling. We two years apart. So she literally could see a quote and not know that it's mine, but say that sound like my brother. And she'll send it to me and say, is this your quote? And I say, yeah, that's my quote. She was like, it's on, look at the page that it's on. Look how many likes this guy. And then I DM that page and say, you are posting my copywritten content. Either credit me or get your page took down. And they'll go to the, immediately, because they know it's not theirs, they'll go to the description and they'll put CC at Tony Gaskins or credit to Tony Gaskins. And this thing may have 400,000 likes on one of my quotes on Instagram. And that's what happened with the, with social media. So today, let me tell y'all, before you listen to somebody, look into their history. I text my sister today after seeing this guy, and I say, why do women listen to anybody? I say, why do women just listen to anybody? Like, check a person's resume. If a man giving you advice about love and relationship, the first question you need to say is, where is your wife? At least require a wife. If he giving you advice about how to make something work with a man, if he ain't made it work with no woman, and if he ain't man enough to show that woman, go on about your business. Go on about your business. If a man is giving relationship advice and you do not see a wife, that need to be your first sign. And even when you see a wife, that don't mean we perfect. That don't mean we got it all right. Now people will go and see my wife and they'll say, oh, his wife got a glow. Even that, you can't believe that because that could be makeup. That could be lighting. That could be lightning. Me and my wife have several disagreements in our marriage. We've gone through several disagreements. We have several dis um, ups and downs. It's been several moments I wanted a divorce. She wanted a divorce. It's been several moments we was at our wits end. But yet, I'm teaching as I learn. I'm teaching as I grow. But I'm actively in the trenches making it work so I'm learning firsthand. I'm not saying what I think. I'm saying what I know. I'm saying what I do. And that's what upset me is when now it's a bunch of clowns talking about, oh, here go Derrick Jackson 2.0. Well, I'm 1.0. Well, I was out here a half a decade before Buddy came up. And it ain't no way in the world. I'm finna be crazy enough to have no whole affair on my wife. Ain't no way in the world. When you when you serve God and you really sold out to God, you ain't fin you not finna play with God. If I got to go through a divorce, if I got to have an affair, you finna see me shut up. If I hit, take a stupid pill and say I want to have an affair, you ain't finna see a video from me on love and relationship. I ain't finna play with the Lord like that. I'm not finna play with the Lord like that. Absolutely not, because I actually love God. And see, that's the thing that people don't understand. People, you, the Bible says you'll know the tree by the fruit it bears. People looking at the fruit and can't even tell what kind of tree it is. 
looking at an orange and biting into it thinks it's an apple. It, you can't see that's an orange. What you talking about? You eating an apple and this is orange. This citrus. This ain't no apple. This ain't no pineapple. This ain't no watermelon. Like, look at the fruit. So if somebody, you ought to know somebody I don't work for God if they're using profanity. If they're using all kind of profanity, they mixing the profane and the sacred. They might say they love God. They might know God. But listen, they ain't all the way where they need to be because God don't mix the sacred with the profane. That right there ought to be. If a man saying something and can't show it, listen to me. If a man saying something and can't show it, he ought to be able to show it. It's a guy on, um, on YouTube. Uh, named Chris Sane, and he teach on stocks. He teaching on stocks. When this man teach on stocks, this man showing you his stock, his stock portfolio right there. He got it on the screen, so you could see this man got X amount of dollars right here on Robinhood, so you could see what he doing. He ain't out here giving you advice and ain't doing it himself. So it's like, it's like this right here. I see people talking on real estate. If you can tell me how to buy a house, how to sell a house, and how to do all this, take me to some of your property. You ain't got to show me the address, but let me see that key turn. Let me see you walk through this empty property. Let me see you walk through this stage property. Let me see you walk through this right here property. Don't, don't So if I'm talking about marriage, you need to be able to see that I'm married. And you need to be able to see that I'm willing to post my wife. Because a guy, he, he wrote, I can't wait to Tony mistress come out. <laughs> You're stupid. Like... That why do you think Buddy didn't post his wife all the time? Because he had mistresses. A mistress is a human being with a heart. Nine out of ten times, the mistress is there because of what a man is telling her about his marriage. She there because nine out of ten times because she got hope that he's gonna leave his wife. She not okay being a mistress. She thinking he going to leave his wife. And that's why a lot of men, most men, 99% of men with a mistress don't ever post a wife other than on her birthday and on their anniversary because they don't want to stoke the fire. They don't want they don't want to poke the bell because if they posting their wife every week how I post my wife on Instagram stories or on Instagram and I talk about her in almost every video if they doing that, that mistress finna get upset. She finna be hot and she finna come out that car. She finna come out the wood where, listen, you know, I've had enough. You tell me you was leaving her. If you don't leave her and now you're talking about her, you're parading her, you're showing all over the line. I guarantee you. That's what they be saying. I, I done seen it. I done seen that's what how the mistress come out. They show it on a video. We done seen the videos. We done seen the posts. We done seen all of that. That's common sense. That's human nature. That's human nature. I ain't I don't have to have a mistress to know that. That's common sense. We see when they come out, a lot of times they come out out of anger. Even the women who told on on Derek, I guarantee you, it probably was. A promise didn't get fulfilled or they was done and he thought he finna ride off into the sunset or the devil sent him or somebody sent him for that goal to expose him but you know what i'm glad it happened because then it started to send a notice to everybody else because Derek ain't the only one it's pastors doing it and they got the same call or even higher calling in a relationship a person who talk about relationships on internet there just ain't no pastor he just give relationship commentary and relationship advice. So it's like technically, that's not even religious. It's not even spiritual. It's not. It, it, he really shouldn't even be held to a higher standard as people hold him. But because of what he's talking about, you expect people to be thorough. But then how can you expect somebody to be thorough if you ain't be thorough yourself and look within and look into their life and say, before I listen to this person, and expect perfection from them. Let me see if they even living it. And that's why men who talking about love relationships who marry and they faithful. That's why we show our wife because we trying to show a difference. But it's a lot of dumb men who can't tell the difference. It's a lot of dumb women who can't tell the difference. And they dumb by choice. They ain't dumb because that's how they born. They choose to be blind. And it's like a man. And I'm gonna be honest with you. That's why men men with a following. That's why men with money 
and men with a following, that's why they don't say my name. That's why they don't come at me sideways. For one, they don't know if they jump off of their ex or their current woman to hire me for coaching because I'm one of the top coaches in the country. That's for one. They don't know what are they business that I know. That's for one. And if you come for me, if you come for me and, and, and blasphemous and or what you call it, libel, uh, slander with lies, with hearsay, hey, I'm on your head. I'm at your neck. And I, and I ain't going to do it illegal. I'm going to be right in there in the court. Defamation. Everything. I want the house. I want the car. I want the 401k. Everything. Because you don't hear lying. And you're disrupting the work of the Lord. Listen to me. If I took a stupid pill and I decide to fall, I'm going to be the first one to tell you, hey, listen, me and wife, we decide to go our separate way. And this right here, this and that. I'm going to be a man by mine. And I'm going to stand up to it. I'm not finna try to play the middle in both ends. I ain't finna try to play both sides. I ain't finna try to have me no mistress and be doing all this over here and on here talking about love and relation. I'm not, I'm not no fool. I ain't finna do it. You ain't finna have me out here looking crazy. And I ain't finna play with God. You know, losing, losing my favor, losing my grace, losing my mercy, losing my life. I don't play with God. And so the same thing about it, this is the thing. Uh, the Red Table just had a talk. The Red Table had to talk. And when they looked into my message, the producer from the Red Table sent me an email. After I went on the Breakfast Club, I got an email from the Red Table, from the producer. And they wanted me to come on the show. And they never made it happen. They probably looked at my videos and seen that I done spoke on Jada and August and Will Smith. All that Tom foolery they got going on. That's because I can't take sides. I got to teach a lesson from the messing i got to teach a lesson so they never brought me on there and i'm totally against a lot of stuff they do a lot of lifestyle they have going on over there but so the red table did a talk and they had Stephen labasi on there who i see him wear a ring but i have not seen a wife but and it could be because i've never went to his page maybe she on there somewhere i don't know and they had i think lewis house on there he say he in a relationship Lewis Howes is a white guy, but a lot of times with white people, they don't necessarily care about the black race. So they're not necessarily going to do their due diligence to say, let me vet this person before I put them on this pedestal and on this platform and give them this platform to reach millions of people. So Stephen LeBossier is like a resident guest on Lewis Howes. Lewis Howes got millions and millions of downloads. And so when it's time to go on this here thing, they had Devon Franklin on there who divorced. They had Lewis Howes on there who not married. And they had Stephen LeBossier on there who I don't know if he married or not. But he wear a ring sometimes. And so a guy, a man commented in the comments, y'all need to bring Tony Gaskins on. He is actually married. And I think I might have liked the comment. In my head, I probably responded they won't do that because that makes too much sense but that's how this world is that's how this industry is what you got to understand the media and the media giant and the powers that be do not care about the health and the wealth and the advancement of your people they care about your clicks your views and your attention but if what they're giving you has no substance if it cannot be verified, if it's not thorough, they don't care about that. If you listening to a false prophet, they don't care about that. If you listen to somebody who don't live what they teach, who cannot enact what they teach, or at least not trying, I'm not perfect at it. What the stuff I teach, I teach it from failure. I teach it from failure. I teach it from mistakes. And I teach it while I'm still trying to perfect it. But if somebody ain't even willing to try it, and to be in the fight, trying to make it work, then in that season, they need to be quiet. But we got people who are out of season talking instead of waiting until they get in the season and getting the lessons and then talking. And that's one thing that I respect uh, about what Anthony O'Neill trying to do is he say out his mouth, I'm no relationship expert. He do relationship content with his financial content and I met Anthony a long time ago. He'll tell you, I've known Anthony for years. 
And he asked me two, three, four times, can we, can we tour? Let's do a tour. You on relationships, me on finance. I told him no. Eric Thomas, uh, manager, CJ asked me several times, can we do a cruise together? Can we do something together? I told him no. And that is how I move. If, if we not in the same lane or I don't know a person personally and know how they get down behind closed doors, then I don't partner up just to make money. Like I need to know you behind closed doors. Like I need to know who you are as a man with your wife. Like I need to be able to sit with you, talk with you. And that's why my heart was broken to see the devil attack the marriages of men that I met. And that men that I met personally and that I spent a little bit of time with and that I was around and the marriage got, you know, attacked and the marriage fell and then they had went on and got remarried. And man, that hurt me. Like I felt bad. Like I feel bad about that because it's like, man, we lost. Like we lost that one. Like, okay, yeah, you might win the next one, but according to the Bible, when you read what the Bible say about divorce. A lot of them, these situations don't fall into covering in the Bible. Like it, the Bible don't cover it. Like it's outside of it. According to a Bible, it's adultery. And me just reading that, I'm like, you know, God, God will forgive. If, if, if that's a sin, God will forgive. He'll gracious and loving and forgiving God. And that's why you'll see people go from, you know, glory to glory or go from what a perceived failure to still look like they winning in their life because God is a gracious and loving and merciful and forgiving God. And that's why I don't judge people. I just tell my truth and I tell the truth of my observation, but I'm not looking down on anybody. I'm not judging anybody because I am up against the same thing that those men that I met and spent a little time with. I'm up against the same thing that they up against. Me and my wife go through the same thing. Like we go through the same challenges. And so I'm understanding of that, but I also embrace it because I understand that I'm gonna go through tests, that we are gonna go through spiritual warfare because of the marriage, the message that I'm carrying. And that's why those men go through that because of what they can mean to the body and what they can mean to the people. That's why they go through the spiritual warfare and the attack, the spiritual attack on their marriage and on their flesh and on their mind and all of that. So, so what I do is I pray for them. I pray for them, but at the same time, I have to highlight it and teach a message from it because this, they would do the same thing with me. When, when you call, you got to speak on what you see. If you turn in a blind eye and you're not speaking on what's plaguing the people, then you're not doing the work of God. If you're not speaking on what's plaguing the people. So although I don't say names, I still teach a lesson from a scenario. Although I don't always say names, it, I'll say names at certain times when I feel necessary, but I don't say names typically in the midst of it because I don't want to heap onto what they going through. And I don't want people who don't know them to go searching them and looking them up and then adding on to like kicking them while they down. Now, I got to speak on it because my tomorrow is not promised and I got to do the work of the Lord, which is to help lead people to Christ and to better us as people and to help. I got to do it. And that's why what I do the same thing with myself. So me and my wife go through some. I do a video on it and I may be doing a video on it without saying our name, but I'm doing a video on it and my wife will know it. She'll know the video about that. And so in the building years, I did that all the time. Like as I made a mistake and I learned, okay, this is how you got to communicate. Okay, this is how you got to pay attention. Okay, this is how you got to deal with your son. Okay, this is how you got to prioritize your time. Okay, this is how you got to uh, buffet your body. This is how you got to do this. this. I would teach a lesson on it. And my wife, she live with me so she'll know, oh, that video come from yesterday. Oh, that, that quote right there come from this here flat tire. That quote right there come from this experience, this conversation. But the public ain't know that. And so that's what we got to realize. Today, we got a lot of fakes who they're doing it as a career path. It's just to make money. They're not connecting to the purpose and actually trying to live what they teaching on. And a lot of people cannot handle what comes with it. So that's why you see men get a platform and they'll stay single for a while because they get so much attention from women and women like 
men of status, men of power, and all of that. So they get so much attention from these women that they don't want to get married because then they can't entertain all them conversations, all them DMs, even if they ain't sleeping with everybody. Even if they just sleeping with one woman or if they sleeping with no women. A lot of guys can't handle that. See, the, the genius about what God does is God allowed me to go through. He allowed me to go through the mistakes and being flattered by attention from women before I got a calling, before I got a purpose, before I got a platform. So that now that I have it, the attention from women, it don't mean nothing to me. The compliments and everything I get from them, it, it don't mean nothing. It means something in the sense of thank you, but it does not turn me on. It don't flatter me to where I'm like, oh, I want to get to know you, spend some time with you, talk to you because you praise me and you praising me and my wife don't praise me like that. She don't say that to me. So let me get to know you, get closer to you. No, they don't do nothing for me because when I was in the rural with women, I was that guy. I was him. So I already know what that fake adulation feel like. I already know what the affirmation from women feel like. I already know that like Ecclesiastes say, it's vanity and vexation of spirit. I already know that. So when a woman come beautiful and she's singing my praises, thank you. God bless you. Thank you for your support. The one want to sign up for a coach says, okay, here go the link. Here you go. Make the payment. As a professional business transaction, here go my fee. It ain't no, oh, rub your bite, you rub mine. Oh, it's a little favor because you look good. No, ain't all that. This is business. And so it's a lot of women in the industry, they don't like me. It's a lot of producers and directors and TV hosts and people like that. They don't like me because, and one woman flat out told me, she said, Tony, your energy is too standoffish. Your energy is too like cutthroat. Like you're not really nice. And, and because you know why? Because they used to men flirting. They used to men flirting and sucking up and kissing behind. And more so than that, I'm a nice guy. I'll give a compliment. I'll give a compliment. I'll be nice. But more so what I'm saying, they used to guys shooting they shot. And so when I come in and I'm the first man, that them been in close quarters with them, that they done share their intimate details and they meaning they secrets and what they going through. And I don't try to take advantage of that and try to move in there and shoot my shot. They like, whoa, what's going on? So some women have thought that I was gay because I didn't try them. And I had let them know, no, it ain't that I'm gay. It's that I'm sold out to the Lord. It ain't that everything always perfect in my marriage. It's that I'm sold out to the Lord. So even when me and my wife go through, I don't go run to another woman. But I'm built like that because of God calling me. I can't say the same thing for my wife because I don't know what she do. If she mad, if she down. I don't know if she'll talk to another guy because I'm not her. All I could do is hope and trust and pray that she wouldn't become sexual with another guy if she mad with me or we going through. But I know who called me. And that's why I can't judge the next man. I can't judge the next woman because I don't know what they going through and how they live behind closed doors. So listen, one of these pastors that done got a divorce that I know personally, they could have got cheated on. They wife could have slept with their ex-boyfriend or with a guy from the church or with the, the lawn guy. And they don't want to put that out there because they don't want to be on all these podcasts. And they don't want all their business out there. And they don't want to make their wife look bad. So that could be the case. And God lets me know that when I'm speaking on a situation to understand, Tony, you don't know all the details. So it could have been for infidelity and you don't know it. You don't know it. And so understand that. And even though one time a pastor got a divorce, I talked to his wife because I know his wife. And I said, did you cheat on him? She said, Tony, absolutely not. But at the same time, I don't know if she would tell me the truth. I'm a public figure. She don't know if she told me that she did, that I wouldn't go online and say, hey, such and such cheated on such and such. I would never do that, but she don't know that. So at the same time, I still got to take what I'm being told with a grain of salt. So listen, 
if you want to see less of this here happening, you got to start reinforcing the fake relationship coaches, these fake relationship gurus who not living it, who not doing right behind closed doors, who can't show you that they are trying to implement what they talking about. If they can't show you that, then stop clicking on it, stop watching it, stop giving it attention, stop sharing it, and go on about your business. And when you go on about your business, guess what? The little business going to dry up, and then they're going to go on and get a real job doing what they really call to. That's what a real job is, doing what you call to. A lot of them today are not called to relationship advice. They call to something else that they ignore because they see somebody else look good doing it. And see, this is the thing, because God got me, I done did business deals that ain't got nothing to do with love and relationship. Seven figure business deals. I done raised capital. I done got capital dumped into my business. So then a guy will see me in a Maserati and he like, oh, that come from a relationship. Oh, he got that from a relationship? No, that come from a seven figure business deal in a media company that I own. That's what got that Maserati. That's what got that Bentley. Not talking about love and relationships. But see, they don't know that. They don't know my behind the scenes. And I don't talk about all of that because that ain't what the people want to hear from me about business deals and about all of that. People come to me to learn about life and love. And so I sprinkle in some business, but that ain't what I'm called to. So when I talk about business, it don't do nothing. It don't go nowhere. So it let me know, Tony, that ain't your calling in this season. Your calling is over here. And if I need to teach on business and streams of income, I do a paid small group of people who say, Tony, we've graduated from the love and relationship. We still going to listen, but we want streams of income. We want business. We want personal brand. We want to be successful coaches. Okay, boom, get in this group right here. Get in this group right here. It's a paid group. I got the charge for it because it's taking time away from my family and it's something that I'm doing and I'm giving you a blueprint to earn. And so, voila. But guys don't know that. And they still won't know it because this video an hour and a half and the ones who critiquing me or the ones who watching me and thinking that all my money come from talking giving advice on relationships with mostly women listening, they ain't gonna get to this point in the video to know that that ain't how I make money. That ain't how I make the majority of my money. They not gonna get here to know that. So, hey, but I want you to know why this is happening today and what you see seeing, that it's literally just a money grab for a lot of you guys. It's just a money grab. It's just, it just another way to make a living instead of selling drugs or scamming or playing sports or doing music because it's not a lot of black men that feel like they got a lot of options. And it's even white men doing it. Now white men is fake relationship culture too. And I'm pretty sure it's, it's other races and nationalities as well, but I just don't know about all of them. Hey, this is Tony Gaston. God bless you. We'll talk soon.